Hey folks, welcome to another episode of the Ten Laws Podcast with East Forest. I'm Forestered of the East. Today I have a really great episode with Dustin O'Halloran. He is an amazing composer and musician, someone that I've admired, well, from like a lot of us as I listened to his music for many, many years. And I was just delighted that we got an opportunity to talk and connect in person just one of the best things about this podcast. I caught him while he's in Iceland. Uh, if, I'm, if, I get, if I'm getting this correctly, his partner is Icelandic, and so they recently moved there. But he's been uh, all over the world. I mean, he spent some time in uh, in Italy and in, in Berlin, Los Angeles, the U.S., and he's done a lot of composing for film and TV. He's got his own solo works and releases that center a lot around the piano and have been an influence on my work. And he's got a really cool uh, project with Adam Wiltsey that's called A Winged Victory for the Sullen, which is just this gorgeous uh, sort of contemporary classical electroacoustic semi-ambient gorgeousness project. So as just describing the electroacoustic, all the different genres he's uh, working with there has a lot of crossover with my own work. And um, they've got some albums out with the Winged Victory for the Sullen that were also deeply influential for my work. And as we talk about in our conversation, um, there aren't a whole lot of bands that I'll travel to see. And I, before COVID hit, I had noticed that they were playing uh, a, s- a short tour with a v- winged victory for the Sullen. They were playing at uh, the old church in Portland, which is where I played last year or whatever. And it's a beautiful venue and, and fairly intimate. I think the cap's around three or 400. So I bought tickets and I was planning on like traveling just to see that show in that space. And it got postponed. Like so many other things have been postponed. So... <laughs> Anyway, I really enjoyed this conversation, and I think you will too. Before we get into that, thank you for giving this podcast a review. Uh, thank you for subscribing. You know, subscribing is a great way to show your support and also to make sure you get all the back episodes. These, this is an evergreen podcast, so you can drop into anything from the past. If something there interests you, check it out. And thanks for sharing it with your friends and for giving reviews. You can do that on Apple Podcasts. Give a little written review or a five-star review. Helps us get the guests that you want to see and helps me feel that uh, this gifted offering is making a difference to to you all. So thanks for reaching out. And if you do want to send us an email or say hi, you can do that at team at eastforest.org. So this week, just just a little personal note, personal note you feel free to skip through this if you want to hop over to the interview. It's been a hell of a week. Uh, Just for me. I mean, I know there's always so much going on in the world these days, uh, which is not a surprise, but I felt like it kind of came home to roost for me emotionally over this last week. And I'm I'm not saying this for any reason other than to say it. I think, I don't know, I think sometimes I get afraid of sharing my own humanity or like, I don't think it matters. But I also think what's helpful about it is to share just that, our shared humanity to say like uh, you know I go on these waves too and this last week I can't say like what one thing you know it wasn't like there was one big event and that that caused me to kind of spiral into depression and sadness um, it was a lot of like small things combining and one of the emotions that I felt bubbling up in me was anger it's not one that I'm as like used to feeling on the forefront, depression, sadness, that's something I've been, that uh, has been bubbling in my mind all my life, really, since um, first grade. It was the first time I felt that when I first had to like fit into the systems of school and stuff. Um, I remember having my first uh, sort of panic attack in third grade when I had this realization of that we have to just go to fourth grade and then to fifth grade and then the jobs and the taxes and blah, 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 and we die. And I was just like, wait a minute, what's the point of all of this? And that's something I've struggled with as I've tried to fit in, you know, kind of put the spherical shape of our our beingness into the square of society, civilization. And I think what was hitting me this last week was 
a grieving process. And this is me trying to process what I still don't fully understand. Uh, a grieving process for the change and for the loss. And I'm specifically speaking to what's happened through our COVIDian times. Because we all had a, a future promise, even though I'm sure deep down a lot of us knew, hey, I can't control the future. But we still trusted in our ability to make plans. We still trusted in our ability to do this perception of making decisions for that which was yet to come. And the ways in the past that we've maybe invested in those decisions. And some of those could be like real investments, like people might have um, bought a house or this or that. Things are like, this is my plan. And, and now it's being sidelined or, you know, more obviously for people like me, we have tours and plans or you you, you had a, a sort of things you were literally investing in and, and you, to help you out as a business and as an artist. And now that's shifting and you have to shift. There's not an option. And... I think in the first weeks or so months of this, part of us, a lot of us in the spring, we're in triage mode, right? We're just responding because we have to. And we're just rolling with this cascade of information. And as we're shifting into the kind of this summer energy, um, when I'm recording this, it's just after Memorial Day and we're moving into summer and the weather's changing. And I think... You know, it's reminded me of like getting divorced and when different seasons would come up, um, it would bring up memories, memories in my body, memories in my heart, the, the deeper parts of my mind. And you start, you start to like, emotions come up, you know, maybe you're comparing to the summer before naturally, like, well, how is this, it's obviously different than how things were a year ago. And some of those differences you don't necessarily like. Like we're getting a little sick of quarantine and, and just people looking at each other like we're all a problem because we can be harboring this invisible disease with each other and not hanging out with friends and, and not doing all the things you do. I mean, I was used to playing and touring and uh, there are pros and cons to that. But one of the pros I'm realizing was it, it was an energetic exchange with you guys. Like I, I'm was fed by the energy of, of being there and like offering an energy and then there's an energy that's received back. And it was very nourishing, very nourishing. But at the same time, now that that stuff has been essentially taken away and we're more and more isolated with ourselves, it really exposes what we're identified with. And for myself, I a little disappointed in myself that like, you know, how much of my sense of well-being is wrapped up in uh, performing or East Forest at all or what this thing is, you know, how is that? Because it's obviously not my identity, but if you identify with it, it is. It's But, you know, when you strip it back, you're a consciousness here now. And how much of that am I satisfied with? But I think I've had this grief and this anger coming up about the things that I've lost and the things that have changed and not knowing what to do about it. And then maybe what I'm angry about is this last week, I was really feeling like a lot of the energy we're doing is trying to prop up a system that's dying. You know, it's like we're trying to rearrange the furniture on the Titanic to keep it afloat. And that's not a judgment on it in the sense that <laughs> it sounds like a judgment, but my it's not a judgment. If you, what I want to say is, we, a lot of us have to, like we have to, we're in an economy and we have to figure out how to pay the bills and keep some of that stuff going. We can't just walk away. Uh, that's not a realistic transition. So we're sort of in this liminal space where we have one foot in an old world that we're trying to figure out ways to keep it going. Like, okay, we're going to live stream. We're going to do this. We're going to do the things to stay active and busy. But then there's this foot in the other world that is very much clearly about pause about repose, about change, about observation and witnessing and not fucking rushing into like the next thing that's really doesn't even want to be happening. I mean, is it, does this make sense? It's, it's what I'm trying to say is there's that friction in me. And maybe I think this is my own like armchair psychology to myself as I stare at a computer screen with a microphone on this podcast. But I'm sharing it with you because... Um, I don't have, you know, my buddies to hang out with as much to, to riff on it. And I've been telling Rada about it, but it can get kind of heavy for me because it gets kind of, you know, sounds kind of negative. And uh, 
I'm processing it with you because I think maybe you guys are feeling it in your own way, but in a similar way. You know, our shared humanity of this experience. And I guess it's okay to feel what you feel. I just want to encourage you to do what you can to stay in this moment because since most of my fear and anxiety is about looking into the future or essentially comparing to the past. And I know it's easier said than done. Hey man, just be here now. But if you can just kind of say, even just break it down into small bricks, like I'm just going to focus on today, just today. And every time I start to wander into the future, I'll bring it back to today or even just this next hour or even next, just next five minutes, if you're really feeling it right now. And just say, that's all I have to do. I'm not going to try to figure out all the things that we don't know. And God knows there's we don't know. We never know, but we really don't know now. And nobody knows. And everyone's spinning their ideas around about where things are going to go in every different direction and the economy and the arts and hanging out with people. And all. it's a lot. And I'm saying I feel it too. But sometimes when we go into these depths, these dark nights of the soul, they really hurt. They really do. And they are confusing. And you don't have to understand it all. Uh, I'm just encouraging you to uh, not push it away, but also let it flow and recognize that there's a processes going on inside of us um, on this deeper level that it's okay for it to happen. And there's a growth there. There's something transmuting and changing and pushing through the soil. And we're in an emergence that's continuing to emerge. So that's my two cents on that for now. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for your support. Uh, I'm continuing to work on music here in the studio in Boise and in Boulder, Utah. I just got a marimba on Craigslist. (laughs) I don't know why. It was like, you don't see those around, especially in in Boise. I'm actually really looking for a vibraphone. Anything that's kind of like a piano, I can essentially play. And I've been playing around with that on some recordings, but I'm probably like, 40-50% 40-50% into I'll say 50% into a new studio record that's very exciting so I'm just continuing to crack away on that and we've got more releases coming for you uh, in the near future so let's get into this conversation with Dustin O'Halloran the one and the only here it is Can you just explain to me a little bit about your international background? I mean, you're in Iceland. I've heard you were in Berlin. You were in Italy. You've also been yeah. in LA. Wait, how does this all work? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's like a, a little bit of chaos, a little bit of curiosity. Um, <laughs> just, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting. I mean, I don't, I've never really meant to be living. It was never my plan to be living in all these different places, but uh I think it just started with the desire to be out of America for a while. And and that just sort of opened up this path to my life that just kept going. (laughs) Are are you American? Yeah, I I grew up in Los Angeles. And so I had a band with singer Sarah Love. We decided to go to Italy to make a record. And we were touring. We were on a label called Bella Union. Yeah. touring a lot in U S or in Europe. And we went out there to make a record and then we both decided to stay for a while. And that just turned into me staying for seven years. And wow. And so, um, yeah. And then moving to Berlin for 10 years and then thinking that I was going to move back to Los Angeles, but now I'm here in Iceland. (laughs) Wow. Berlin. I've, been to Berlin a few times. It's a, it's a great music town. It seems like a really uh, vibrant place to be as an artist. I mean, as we both know, there's yeah. a lot of people making music uh, 
sort of in the vein that you do and crossover with my own work that are in Berlin. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, did you feel like being there uh, served a purpose for sort of fostering the work that you do? Maybe for the, the culture there, like the music scene or just, yeah, or not? <laughs> well, no, it, well, it was a really important time, actually. I didn't realize how much I would do there and, and, and how much just being in Berlin sort of brought so many different collaborations. Uh, right. We, I, and one of the, probably one of the big reasons why I stayed for so long is we had this really beautiful kind of co-op studio situation it was eight studios and I shared with Johan Johansson and Hildur Gutnodotir and there was just this very special community of artists and we all had our own separate studios but it was sort of together in this big warehouse is that and funk house no uh, it, it, this was that's a different place that's yeah far, farther away those are more recording studios and this was our own complex it was in Kreuzberg and um okay so it i think that created this very special atmosphere and we were collaborating and also i have this project with another composer in belgium in brussels uh, it's called a wing victory for the sullen yes and, and brussels and, and berlin are, it's it's about an hour on flight it's so close and so that was another project that's been you know, been very active and we just jumping on planes and going over there and working. And, uh, over there we have these string players, uh, that are called the echo collective and they started working with us and they eventually worked with Johan and, you know, it was just all this big community of people that yeah. in, in Europe that we all connected and, and my long time, uh, sound collaborator Francesco Donadello who I met while living in Italy he moved to Berlin he started a studio and he's become sort of the epicenter for a lot of you know he worked with Johan he helped Johan develop a lot of sounds he's done all of my records all of the winged victory for the sullen records he worked with Hilde Kupatetir and helping her with, um, you know, doing a lot of, he's like kind of a sound research. He goes much beyond just a mixer. And so. In what ways? Like what what is he doing beyond the mixing? Well, he helps develop techniques like analog techniques. And um, he created some really, he, he was creating tape machines that would be hooked up to a modular synthesizer and could, play the pitch of a tape i mean he was doing crazy scientific stuff uh very experimental but scientific and um uh yeah he's just and he so a lot of people coming to him to record and explore and you know there's just been berlin was just this sort of energy of exploration and sound and and uh and then all of us were also working a lot of us working on film scores as well. So, um, And was, was that a conscious choice for you to get into film scoring or did opportunities come your way and that became a part of your, your life? Well, I, I think I've always had a big fascination with film and film music. And I think that's always been something that I loved. It was always a big influence even when I was playing in a band, it was always something that I, um, Morcone and this, you know, just this, this, it's, it's been, I don't know, it's, it's kind of had its own path in music, I think, that uh, is really interesting. And um, so I think, I think I was always pulled towards it, uh, but I didn't really it, you know, came to me sort of naturally. I didn't, I wasn't seeking it out. I was making my own records. And the first time I worked with film was with Sofia Coppola for Marie Antoinette. And that was, that's a great first thing. (laughs) And yeah, you know, and that was, that was just because I was making piano music in a, you know, in a, in a village in Italy. (laughs) Yeah. It wasn't, I was so far from Hollywood or anything. So, you know, it, it, 
things have happened. You know, my life is definitely a series of serendipitous events that continue. But obviously, you're, you know, it's just what you're putting out that brings things to you. So, well, do you, do you find that when you write? Because I think writing for film or picture in general is is kind of tough because um, there's a very like they have specific needs and you're, you're essentially trying to serve the picture and mm-hmm. working with the director and so you have these constraints and do you find that doing that versus making music is just for you that you're releasing under your name or just music that's just a creative ask you it's just for that like a wing victory for a sullen or something. Um, yeah. that there's those limitations of working for film like do you find that in a sense like i'm sure it's satisfying but is it is it creatively stif- stifling at all i mean like, it doesn't it get you don't get to express yeah. the, something as pure well it's 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 a little bit of both and i think that i as you sort of go deeper down the rabbit hole of film scoring it's i you start to understand it as a a way of life differently than in the beginning in the beginning people i think it was beginning i was my first scores were more like records in a way because people really wanted something specific from me and a lot of the music that i would write was not to picture and they would just use it in their film but Mm -hmm. as i started to get into a more serious role of of composing for film the the compromises become bigger and the limitations become bigger, but then you get to explore things that you wouldn't explore in your own music. Right. Um, but it's, I, you know, I, I, I've had a, an interesting path because I've, I've been able to have a chance to record with really big orchestras to do things that I probably wouldn't have done with my own music. And I learned a lot from doing that. Um, but I think at the end, yeah, it's, it's, it, it, there's a lot of compromise, so I think that I'm I personally I'm sort of pulling back and starting to work on my own music again, and I think that it's something you have to kind of protect. Yeah, because is is writing for film? I would imagine pretty lucrative if you can get into the factory, getting those jobs. I would imagine compared to uh, you know creating our own music and, and just releasing it. Yeah, and I think you, you know it's it's. It is work, and uh, yeah, I, I think you know if you're coming from a place where you're just used to working, you, you can kind of easily just fall into that and go, "All right, I'm just going to do the, you know, do this, and, and it's it's good work." But you can, you know, you can you lose your way a little bit in it because it's it's it is it's it you serve a film and you learn to write serving a film, which is what it needs but it also you start to lose touch with your own intuition so i think it's important that you step away from it from time to time and uh and just kind of get in touch with your intuition again and that's sort of tell me more about that like what is that thing you think you're losing touch with that intuition that you are then i'm assuming saying you're more in touch with it when you're writing music that isn't a picture you know yeah yeah. what is that well, picture and, and film inherently is a square. It, it, it it's 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 a box that has this. You know, you start with a script that has a defined story. You then you create an edit which has defined start and end points. You know, there's there's parameters and it has to sort of live in this box. And um, it becomes a part of something else. It's it's you know it lives inside of a, of a story the constraints of that in a sense it, it, the constraints yeah. of a story the constraints of uh, uh, there's but a start and, and end there's a, there's, yeah right yeah. The timeline and then, and then the constraints of 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 the imagination of the producer and the director mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. everybody involved so um you learn to navigate you, you know you develop your intuition starts to shift towards understanding the needs of the, of all of that rather than just how you write for yourself. And you always should pull from yourself, but, you know, that's, but it gets complicated. I think that um, it's, it's, it, it can create a lot of frustration because your instincts of may differ, you know, be different than the directors. And that's right. where 
you know, that's where when you meet directors where you're really in line together, it's very rare and special. And, and, you know, a lot of composer director relationships are very sacred and they only work together, I think, because, um, obviously music is a huge role with a lot of filmmakers. So, yeah, I remember way back in college taking a class on music and film. And I remember this idea that music is the thing that takes a two dimensional medium and makes it three dimensional. It literally uh, takes that picture in front of you on the screen and through the sound waves is connecting it to the body. Yeah. And it's sort of the, the, the thread that takes yeah. the person to the story. Yeah. I, yeah. It's interesting. I recently worked on a film that had very little music. It was only about twenty minutes of music, which mm-hmm. is which is very rare in this day and age where everything feels like it needs to be filled with music. And uh, it was really nice and refreshing that he wanted to, you know, let the story play out mostly without it. And um, I really appreciated that that space. And it was it, it's. Um, the film is called Ammonite. It has uh, Kate Winslet and uh, Sershi Ronan. I think, that's, I think that's how you say it. <laughs> um, but it's you know those are these are really rare directors, and um, it's uh, I think that's it's really nice when you work with somebody that just gives a lot of space. And I actually really like the fact that, that you know there doesn't have to be music all the time, and it. I think that uh, finding a way for it to be three dimensional without music is is a really yeah it's is a, a, is a is a, a skill challenge for filmmakers. So when you're making music for yourself, quote unquote, mm-hmm. what is the thing that you are trying to get in touch with? Like, what is the litmus test for you? That's like ah, there it is. Like that's what I want to engage with in the music, or is there a consistent theme there or feeling? Well, I think that's what I describe as your intuition when you actually really are feeling connected and i think that every musician knows that feeling and Mm -hmm. you know and i think writers and anybody who creates art from nothing understands that uh anybody that's looking for that feeling of it's just this moment where you feel connected and um it's probably a little bit different for everybody, but I think that it's, it's that, it's that sense that you, when you know that it's right for you and, um, yeah, yeah, I totally uh, know what you're saying. Yeah. And I think that that's, it's, it, it's being in touch with, with that is something that has to be cultivated and nurtured and, and, uh, takes time. And, uh, it's, um, I think it's, it's just all, it's sort of the birth, birthplace of, of all art is coming from that desire to create and trusting your intuition and, and, and being um, very open and, and free to... to and, and there's a compassion with it for me because I know it's such an ebb and flow. You know, you get in spaces where you are in that space where you feel like you're in that flow and then spaces where you very feel like you're not. Yeah. It feels like a mental game more than anything. And if anything, I've learned over time how to let go of the negativity and be like, look, it's okay. sometimes you fall off the wagon and I know that tomorrow I'll get back on and sometimes, yeah. you know, it feels great and sometimes it doesn't. And you just like, I have to just be like, I'm not going to give that too much credence mm-hmm. uh, to, to say that uh, this won't work or I don't have ideas or this, you know, every project goes through those ups and downs and ups yeah. and downs and yeah. lefts and rights. And that is the process. Yeah, Absolutely. And yeah, I think it's in, it's an interesting moment now because I'm sort of spending time with uh, my daughter, and I'm not, you know, I'm sort of taking a little bit of a break from music, and mm-hmm. get, you know, just and letting that be okay. I've, I'm usually a very I usually have a lot going on, a lot of projects, and and um, it's just you know, just being okay to step away for, for a little while. Yeah. As I told you, um, when we were scheduling this, I had tickets for your show, wing victory for the selling show in Portland, Oregon, because mm-hmm. you're playing at the old church, which I've played at. And it's such a beautiful venue. And I was like, Oh, that'd be a perfect place to see you guys. I've never yeah. seen you play. And, um, it, that was, that was postponed or canceled along with everything else in the world. And, 
I don't know about you, but this time has been, and I hope, I think like this opportunity is there for everyone. It's a kind of opportunity for rebirth or reinvention Mm -hmm. where maybe even just like some of the more subtle, tender parts of our lives, like you're talking about spending time with your daughter is there for the taking in a sense. It's like letting us step into it more fully. And then you can probably ask yourself as we move forward from this, what do I want to keep, you know? Yeah. Well, it's an interesting time because people aren't able to spend as much money as they usually do because everything's closed. And so what do you, what do you need to survive? What's really necessary? And, Mm -hmm. and um, I think probably a lot of people are realizing that just having a simple life actually is really, (laughs) really nice. (laughs) Cooking your own food and just Mm -hmm. being a little more self-sufficient and um, less, uh, you know, capitalistic is actually a much more relaxed feeling. Yeah, it's, it's like going, getting back to our roots of being human uh, outside of this hyper speed digitized world we've we've been in. Mm-hmm. I would I'd imagine you've been very busy over the last ten years. Yeah, <laughs> and it's it's interesting because I feel that there's been a lot of I have a lot of projects which and I enjoy doing multiple things, but the speed of of how they move has felt really fast to me, and I feel like. I, I actually really love doing one thing really well at a time. And I found, yeah. I found the last few years to be a little bit overwhelming in the sense that there was so many things happening and, and how quickly they needed to happen. And, um, it's just, uh, it's nice to feel that maybe I'm just going to, I'm use this time to sort of lay out things a little bit slower and, and take it a little bit slower and be okay with that. Yeah, why not, right? It's uh, yeah. maybe that is a kind of personal choice uh, to to set the timeline yeah. let the, versus the timeline set, sets it for you. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you know, a lot of that I think is based on how we build our, you know, like our needs. And uh, and if you're able to live a little bit more simpler and a little cheaper, it gives you more freedoms to. To, you know, to take things slower. And, and I think that that's probably a lot of people are, are feeling that and realizing that they're like realizing, oh yeah, I didn't need five subscriptions of this. And I didn't need to, <laughs> you know, have all those coffees and making coffee at home is fine. And, and then you realize you've saved so much money and what you get back is time. And yeah, I, time I have a lot of friends them. who speak to this. Yeah, I have a spot yeah. I live in, in, in Southern Utah, which is like, it's, it's nothing there. It's just about being on the land. And a lot of people choose to be there because they they didn't want to be part of that, that other life. And one of my friends has a great phrase. I mean, these are guys, some of them literally live in like yurts with their family or, you know, um, some of them live in caves for a while. Yeah. And he always says he's time rich. He's like, I'm time rich. You know, what yeah. do you want to do? Oh, sure. Let's do it. You know, like, oh, yeah. you want to hang out for the day? Okay. Yeah. Um, and that's their, that's their you know, barometer of wealth Yeah, is, is, is how much they can enjoy the, just the moment Yeah, and not be running anywhere. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's true. But they don't have a lot of money and, but they, yeah. they design their life where they're like, well, I, I work as little as I can so that I can not, so I guess I can just be. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think it's, you know, that's, I think you know, if, if you're a creative person and there's, you need certain channels to, you know, to, to, to put your work out there, you know, there's a certain inherent connection to, to, you know, to the modern world that you, you, you may need, but, um, of course, but I really respect everybody's decisions. And I think that, but overall, I think just the, this whole global pullback, I hope, you know, brings a little more awareness and, a little more peace to people. I mean, a lot of people are having a hard time as well. So, you know, obviously like certain people are just privileged to be able to have time. Some people are, you know, in very dire situations, but I think, I don't know, hopefully it just brings communities together and people can help each other more. Yeah. Yeah. And you're, so you're in Iceland, right? And that's where your family lives there or you're, you also Um, spend time there? 
Well, my partner is Icelandic, and um, uh, I, I because I shared a studio in Berlin with, with a lot of Icelandic people, I sort of ended up knowing you know a bit of the Icelandic mu- music community here. It's quite a community. Yeah, it's and, and it's <laughs> it's it's you know it's it's a uh, it's crazy how such a small island and such as you know there's only three hundred and ten thousand Icelanders. Like there's what a you know how many talented people are. are yeah, here. maybe you're just going there to drink the water so you can become an <laughs> even better musician. That's what I always thought. I've been yeah. there four times and performed a couple times there, and I always had the same thought as you as like, yeah. why is there such a high proportion of incredible music coming out of this place? Well, it kind of goes back to what you're saying. I mean, here just because of the co- small community and, and how small of a town it is, people are time rich more than other mm-hmm. places because there's a lot of a lot less distractions and it, you're not going to just jump on a plane so easily and go somewhere because it, it is a bit of a travel to, to leave Iceland and um, you end up having a lot of time. I mean, that's, I, I find that in, you know, everything you do in your day is, is very, you know, the distance is, it's a tiny city. <laughs> So it is small and you're never really outside nature too. I mean, even in Reykjavik, you can always see around you and you don't ever mm -hmm. feel like man has taken over like in other cities. Yeah. I mean, there's something about the horizon that you see and driving out, you feel, I don't know, there's a sense of time and space here that you just feel and it's very relaxed. So I think that's a big part of why there's a lot of great music here people have time to just sort of and you know the weather's not great (laughs) a lot of the year Mm -hmm. so Mm -hmm. you have nothing more to do than just sit in your studio and become you know a great guitar player or pianist or whatever it is you're doing a a great sculptor there's a lot of artisans here and i think that just the nature of, of this place just lends itself to that when I was there, I also had a discovery, and maybe you can verify this for me, but um, I was someone gave me a jar of psychedelic mushrooms that they said were just growing. They dried them. Like, these are just, this is what grows here, and this is, you can have this. And, mm-hmm. grow. and then I, another guy, like, I remember going to, there's this really um, falafel spot in Reykjavik near that little square, that little tiny mm-hmm. square. You know, oh, spot. Yeah. yeah, that's good. Good, good uh, place. And I was in there, and I'm, this guy comes in and I kind of like opened the door for him and we had this strange moment. You know, he's acting really weird and giving this weird grin to me. Mm-hmm. And then I was like, I think he's tripping, you know? And then like I played a show and the guy who opened for me was tripping, like as he played. So I'm sure you, I'm sure you know him. He wouldn't mind. Tater, Tater, Magnuson. Do you know that guy? I don't know him actually. Oh, he makes really cool, funny music. Anyway, big, long kind of reddish hair. Yeah, okay. As And I just realized that, like, these things are growing all over the place. Mm-hmm. So you're walking to work and you might, it might be like, not that weird to be like, I'll just pick one and eat it. You know, maybe it's like a microdose in a sense. And, yeah. and then I started thinking about the history there of like leprechauns and, you know, that kind <laughs> of underworld stuff. And I was like, oh, yeah. now it makes sense because for a millennia, they've probably just been dropping in and of course you do hear the earth <laughs> you do yeah. you, you, you get closer to the landscape that way it's a way of sort of your own divination and education and so i felt that that was a part of the culture and the landscape there and dropping you probably further into the mystical and nature yeah uh that i, I hadn't really previously thought about and maybe that had something to do with yeah. the creative spirit in addition to it's very egalitarian socially and um, like you said, it's not a lot of distractions and yeah. they had good music education in the school. But the mushrooms, man, yeah. they're all over. <laughs> I know. They are. <laughs> <laughs> and also there's the, and the, the non-psychedelic ones are just growing everywhere that you can pick and eat as well. If you're, you know, if you're – for mushroom people, I was um, working with a, a – in a – assistant here and he was a big uh, you know i think mushroom people are particular people there's they are yeah (laughs) and he was going out and picking these great mushrooms uh you know i don't know much about him and i would never do it because i probably would just die but um 
he was picking grape mushrooms and cooking with them. And he was really into it. They're just everywhere, all over the city at certain times of the year. Um, yeah, man. I was doing a podcast uh, with Peter Broderick and he says his favorite thing to do is to forage. Yeah. There's like, yeah, you can really forage out here. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, Iceland um, seems like, to me, it seems, I know the weather can be kind of shit, but I don't know. I really love the people there, and it seems like a really cool place to be doing uh, music. Uh, yeah. I mean, I know the limitations of getting gear and all that kind of stuff. It's nothing like Berlin, but yeah, um, there is there is some amazing music that's been coming out of there, no doubt. Yeah. No, it's it's not a bad place to be, especially in this crazy moment in time. So I do feel lucky. Did you bring um, all your gear there? Or do you keep it there like pianos? What? How does this work for you? Uh, well, I was I brought my studio gear from Berlin, and it's um, I still have to set it up. But I uh, I was about to ship my piano. Uh, it's still supposed to come, but it's, things have just been delayed because of COVID. So, mm -hmm. but yeah, but the plan is to bring bring my piano that I had in Berlin here. Okay. And can I can we talk gear a little bit? I I would be remiss if I didn't. I don't want to go too deep down it, but yeah. I'm always interested in like um, uh, what kind of I know you do a lot of upright stuff in your studio, and what kind of uh, techniques do you like for recording that? As far as just your microphone setups, you do a lot of close miking or yeah. I mean, I guess I've, I'm always sort of experimenting. Um, I have these vintage AKG microphones that they're. They have a C12 capsule. It's one of the mm -hmm. early, early versions. They're a tube, and those sound really beautiful. Um, I love Cole's microphones as well. Um, and uh, not too noisy for you, or? Uh, well, I usually use them with a mix of. I'll use Shoops as well mm -hmm. uh, with them, and um, uh, when I work with Francesco, he's always experimenting with different microphones, but when we record grand we're usually using a pair of u67s which i really love and um uh but yeah i mean i kind of have a cl collection of vintage microphones and the hi-fi microphones that i usually go to are the shoops but i usually use those in always sort of in tandem to uh to vintage microphones i I, I really enjoy the Gefells, which are the East German version of, yeah. of Neumann, and those are those are really cool. They're kind of lo-fi, but hi-fi. They're they have a, they always have a very special sound. And I have a UM, I think it's called UMT eighty-seven or forty. Wait, what's it called? It's a, it's sort of like a, a it's got like a basically a forty-seven type capsule, but mm -hmm. it's a FET mic. Um, yeah, I like that. It's very very like clean and standard but yeah. i use it a lot for vocal mics but i, I wish yeah. i had a matched pair for piano yeah i mean they're they're i've been kind of getting more into the gefals they're i think they're very interesting mics especially for how much they are and uh yeah they're you know it's just good to have a lot of different colors no doubt yeah. so um You've done some collaborations, lots of collaborations, uh, whether for scoring, but also with the Winged Victory for Sullen and others. Um, how, you know, what? How do? What's the value for you of collaborating? I mean, I know for me, it's like I always learn so much mm -hmm. uh, from working with someone else. But then there's also the limitations, but those can be great. I mean, limitations in general sometimes seem like a, a must. For yeah. creating anything otherwise it's just a sea of choice uh, yeah no no i'm i'm the same i sort of need limitations to be really creative like do you set them yourself sometimes i mean sometimes they come to you like a film score yeah. is filled with limitations but yeah i well i kind of you know i'll sit down and you know sometimes i'll get crazy and just break out all the pedals and you know this and whatever sense and but I, I, I tend to keep it a little bit more analog. And that's just gives a natural limitation. I think the digital world for me is maybe just too many <laughs> choices. So I sort of start, you know, I usually start everything analog, whether even if it's electronic, it usually starts in a, either with uh, in pedals or a modular synth or something that, you know, that naturally just, just has limitations in a way because it is mm -hmm. what it is. And, start there 
a piano, string quartet. Um, and then if I would do anything afterwards, I'll use specific tools, but at least I have something that's got a direction. And uh, that's usually always starts with an analog source. So that I find that that's, a, for me, a better process. Um, but it's really, you know, I think I kind of, obviously, if I'm sitting down and I know I'm going to write a, a piece for piano, that is, it's just going to be that. And I'll let it just be that. Um, sometimes I know I might want to embellish with strings or, I, it, it, you know, there's, it goes on different paths, but. It would be, yeah, I guess. I guess in some way, I sort of start with natural limitations. Do you, I do kind of start from a place of improvisation? Like, what's that creative process like for you when you're in the beginning genesis of music? Yeah, I, I mean, sometimes it's just I, I might want to explore a sound, and maybe that will develop into a piece of music, and that might be me just wanting to, like, you know. I, I want to explore the Prophet Five, <laughs> and I just start mm -hmm. digging into it, and that just ends up sort of being, you know, you know, a piece of music just gets created from that. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's, I mean, the the genesis of the genesis of a piece of music is always starting from some sort of improvisation or experimentation. I think right. that's that's for everybody and. Uh, you know, maybe the only, I feel like piano is maybe a little bit different because I'll, it is, it, the instrument is what it is. And so you sit down and you, you start to improvise and, and then carve things out. But it's, uh, piano is always the piano. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, I mean, I think that every, the piano is a special way that I work in the sense that I, I don't record anything until I've finished a piece, and so I, mm. I sort of, I just, I write with the memory of what I'm doing, and it always sort of goes into memory. And I find that if I can't remember it, then it's really usually not worth keeping. So, I use my memory as a way to sort of, it's like a filter, and then I don't record it until the end. So I, I'm not recording a bunch of improvisations and then building a piece from that. I'm usually just playing. And then, and then when something sort of starts to form, I'll come back to it. I'll come back to it. I'll build on it. I'll, you know, and these big long pieces are just done that way. And then I won't record them until I know it. And usually when I know it, I remember it for years. So it's, um, that's interesting. Huh. Yeah, yeah. I think it was Regina Spector said that's how she wrote too. Like she'd write something and then if she could remember it the next day, she knew it has something special and she'd keep working on it. Yeah. That'd be scary. Because <laughs> I'm like, what if it's, it's a real trust, you know, well, like your it, memory, to, your unconscious in a sense. Yeah. I mean, I find if I read music, I don't remember it because it's, it's accessing a different part of my brain. Mm. I have a hard time remembering pieces if I'm reading sheets. Um, but if I just play it and I internalize it, then I'll, I remember it much longer. It's like, a, I don't know, it's stored somewhere else. Well, you, I read you say once that inspiration was a way of kind of transferring ideas for you. Do you remember that? Or can you speak more to what that feeling is for you? As, a, as opposed to being inspired by other music or inspired by others. Um, Versus, you know, the idea of like, everyone says like, how are, you know, what do you listen to? What are you inspired by? But it's sort of like, <laughs> I always think that, well, I'm inspired by everything I hear and I, yeah. And inevitably when I, in a, let's say I hear a piece and I'm, I'm sort of like, I go to write music and I'm almost like pulling from that. It comes out in a very different way, but you know, it's being filtered through my own creative yeah. process, I suppose. Well, I think, it, you know, music is such a chain. I mean, all art is a chain. It's a, you know, it's a link. There's links of the chain. It's this long chain that it's just going in both directions it's being created and it goes into the past and um i think that we're always pulling from something that was built before i i think that that's the nature of music is that there's been 
you know, nobody's pulling things just out of the air that never existed. I mean, there's always some DNA of something else. And I think that um, that's sort of the beautiful thing too, is that we, maybe it's just a feeling, maybe it's just you, there's certain music that resonates with you and that feeling you want to transfer into your own music Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. you want to, you want that part of the chain to continue. Um, And I think that maybe, maybe it's a form, maybe there's a, a technique or something that you take the DNA of and you build on it. And, um, it was, it was something that actually maybe we did a little bit scientifically that was a happy accident that actually informed a way to work, which was uh, Adam and I, as a wing victory for the Sullen, did a, a remix of Johan's. And um, he sent us the, he wanted us, he was doing re-releasing Angleborn and he was doing some remixes. And so we, he sent us this track, which was basically just a stereo recording of a quartet in the church. There was no separation. It was just a stereo recording. And so we were thinking, how do we, you know, how do you remix something that's beautiful and just, and just a stereo, you know, there wasn't anything to kind of pull out of it. Um, so what we did was we, basically took the track and ran it through a program called Melodyne, which basically mm-hmm. gives you all of the information, the notes. And we basically sort of mapped out the whole chordal DNA of the piece. And then we started to deconstruct it and kind of pull out different pieces and then send that information through a modular send through all these different things. I, did piano parts and we basically created a new piece of music but from the dna of the actual notes and when we were working on our new record the undivided five um i kind of wanted to explore that a little bit more but instead of taking midi information i was i thought well why don't we just go back even farther and take you know go back to some sheet music and just because that's basically the same thing as MIDI information in a way. It's, you know, the Old notes. Old school MIDI. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so um, we took a piece, there's a bar, single bar of WC, And I thought, you know, so much, there's so much information sometimes in, in some of, this, of these old works. I mean, a, a single bar of Bach is so filled with so much incredible DNA. There's so many amazing chordal if it's just like a passing chord but like what's happening is can be so incredible but it happens so fast it goes by so fast because there's just inherently a lot of that music just was moving much quickly and you barely catch it and i thought what if you just take this single bar and just expand it and just blow it up and take six chords and we just sort of pulled all the notes and the dna from these six chords of a single bar and created a 10 minute piece of music. Wow. Um, wow. Which piece is that? Is that, that's the remix? No, it's the first track on the new record. It's called our Lord WC. Wow. Yeah. And so that's basically pulled from the DNA of this bar of music. And, uh, we just did variations. We did different, just kind of finding these, the beautiful harmonics in there and what, you know, recording strings and, it's a really interesting way to work because I think that in the past, that's a lot of people did that consciously, subconsciously, but I think it's a, it's a, it's a really beautiful way to, to start making music and, and take a little piece of the chain, but it's, you know, it's not, it's, it's, it's not, it's, it's pulling something good. It's not trying to copy something. And I think that that's uh, an important part of music is that people do, you know, there is this shared, you, you know, uh, I, I'm not protective of, you know, if somebody takes some, you know, ideas from what we do, I don't, I'm not protective of them that way. I feel like music has to be expanded on and, and I mean, hip hop wouldn't, wouldn't exist without that. So, you know, I mean, I think that that's, 
there's so many great things that are pulled from other sources. So I think it's, um, you know, it's a, it's a healthy way to be creative. Is there anything that you've been really inspired by lately? Um, you know, it's funny. I'm working on so much music these last years. I actually haven't <laughs> been listening to a lot of music. Uh, I mean, in her, you know, I have a lot of friends and I'll listen to their records, but I'm not seeking out as much music as I, as I, as I used to. I'm, uh, I have my vinyl player at home and I'm tending at home. I tend to listen to just, I'm, I don't, for some reason, I'm just listening to old jazz on, on vinyl. Yeah, me too on vinyl as I listen to it. Well, I mean, yeah, Patrick so. Carney from the Black Keys, he's like, you know, you really, if you think about it with your vinyl, usually you have like, I don't know, 15 to 20 records you listen to just yeah. over and over again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I'm listening to a lot of Miles Davis and... Um, I yeah. get deep into Keith Jarrett's vinyl. He has so many vinyl and they're yeah. usually pretty cheap. So if I ever see <laughs> one, I buy it. And some of them are really weird but uh, I dig it. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. Soundtrack, you know, I love like sixties Italian soundtracks. Those are great on vinyl. Um, mm. but uh, yeah, I mean, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm kind of in a moment where I'm, yeah, I'm not, I'm not listening to a ton of music. Um, I'm just working on music all day. I find silence actually really you know, yeah, right. really great. <laughs> I mean, we, uh, Iceland is a really windy place and the sound of the wind is, is one of those beautiful sounds. The house just shakes and you hear the wind howling and, and I, I really love it. Where in Iceland are you? I'm in Reykjavik. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I have a, a friend there that I got to know over the years who owns a yoga, yoga studio in town and, mm -hmm. uh, Tomas, he's a great guy. A lot of so many great people there. But yeah. So with all these shifts and and change and and where your career's been at, you've written such amazing music and all these amazing collaborations. Uh, it seems like you're going through a bit of a shift uh, of location again, and obviously with COVID. Yeah. What are you excited for, or do you are you seeing uh, something come to shape of where you see the future of music and for yourself? Well, I, I just finished, I was supposed to be on tour, as you said, with yeah. Wing Victory, and we finished that record. And that was a really interesting experience. I mean, I've, the shows have been great. And hopefully we'll get to come back and do, and, and do the U.S. tour. Uh, and I think that, you know, the records that Adam and I have done, I'm really proud of that rec the record that came out. It's, it's, it was a... Uh, it was a big process and I learned a lot and I think sonically I'm really happy with how it came out. So I feel like that the last, especially the last five to six years, I've put a lot of energy into that project. And so now I feel... It's a great, but, but, uh, great project, man. I mean, oh, it's, it's so beautiful. Yeah. And so I think with the completion of this record, I feel like I have a little bit more space to start to focus on my own music which i haven't haven't done in a while and uh, i'm excited about that just kind of getting back to uh, exploring what what i want to do and and i have some ideas but i'm also really open right now and i think it's been so long as so many musical projects i've done in the last five six years have been collaborations so it's gonna be uh yeah, it's like getting to know myself at this point in my life again and with everything, you know, living in a new place and having a, you know, having a child, there's just been such major life changes. So it's going to be, um, mm. you know, you just have to kind of get to, it's like getting to know yourself again. And uh, that's, but I definitely have a new record that I'm going to be working on and I signed a new record deal with Deutsche Grammophone. Oh, so, um you know, there is, uh, that's, that's coming and I just need to sort of sit down and get into it. Well, you know, what I'm hearing from you is that what the blessing is that you need time to do something like that and allow it to happen over a time scale. Like you were saying that maybe it doesn't feel rushed yeah. and, uh, maybe what's great right now is that you're time rich. Yeah. I, <laughs> 
it was interesting. My first, my records that I, the first records that I made in Italy, I, I was very time rich. I was in a small town and I just was sitting at the piano <laughs> and there was no film scores. There's nothing sort of over me, uh, pushing me to finish. And, and I think that I, you know, I realized I hear the time in those recordings. I can feel it. I can feel time. Mm. And I think that is what I love about those records that I made living there. And I feel like it's something that I want to get back to because um, I think that somehow it's the, it's also the music that lasts the longest when you give it time. I hate to say this, but it's true. It's timeless. I mean, yeah, when, you know, but you feel giving think, it know, time creates a timelessness. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I, you know, jazz musicians, I think live in this, in a, in another sensibility of time. It's always about capturing the moment, but at the same time, they're always, you know, working on, you know, they're always like in this direction. And, um, I think, to carve out music, to compose it is more, it's, it's, it's like sculpting. You, it takes time. You got to sit back and look at it. You need to mm-hmm. think mm-hmm. about it. And it, it you know, your things are born from improvisation, but you really sculpt it to a finite shape. And that's, I think what really beautiful timeless composition is, is that's the beauty of it. It's, I think there's a beauty in jazz and capturing a moment, but the, but the other, side of it is carving out something that is will stand the test of time so that's uh it's finding that balance well that's inspiring me because i mean i have recordings that go from either end of the spectrum where something that's literally a recording of an improvisational thing i did this music for mushrooms album that was a five hour improvisation but it's just that Mm -hmm. and then it's it is what it is versus a studio record that you could work on for many months yeah yeah. Uh, and I think they're both, you know, they're two different approaches and I think they're both can be really, you know, produce interesting results. It's just, uh, it, you know, one just needs more, more time and the other is, is the, you know, it's, it's just the, the moment. So no doubt. Well, I'm, I, for one, am very interested to see what comes out and to hear what you create, but you know, uh, take your time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm no gonna rush. Try. No I'm rush. Try. Well, you know, if the world just stays like this, it's going to be in, in my favor. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's the silver lining yeah. for all of us. It's a very yeah. interesting gift that is uh, inside the bitter medicine of this experience. And yeah. for each of us, it's to be uh, cultivated in the way that, you know, we choose to cultivate it. But uh, yeah. I'm excited for you, too. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, I'm looking yeah. forward to getting back into it. Well, thank you so much for uh, giving us your time. This seems like a good place to bring the conversation to a close. Yeah. Uh, Thanks for having me. Yeah, man. And um, hope we can do it again. And uh, it's been a pleasure getting to know you. Thank you very much. Well, good luck to you over there. Thank you. And stay safe and keep, uh, you know, make some music during this time. Thank you so much, Dustin, for joining us. It was just a total honor for me to be able to talk to him, and I'm really hoping we can do it again. Definitely check out his music. His solo piano stuff is just beautiful, and a wing victory for the sullen is the next level. And he's got the film scores. He's a lot of a lot of things going on. And uh, if you aren't familiar with his work, I'm glad you are now. This track you're hearing in the background is called "Our Lord Debussy" by Dustin O'Halloran. Lovely, beautiful. Uh, If you want to hear it in its full glory and all of his music in high fidelity, please do so where you listen to music as these podcasts are kind of low bit rate. But I'm really honored we could have this track uh, as part of this podcast right here. Thanks again for reviewing the podcast. If you haven't done it, you can do it more than once on Apple Podcasts. It helps us get the guests you want to see. Please subscribe. Uh, You know... And thank you for all the support of the merch you guys buy or the messages you send and the sharing you do on social media. It means a lot to me to feel, especially that I'm in a community now in these times where I don't get to see you guys too much on the road. Um, it's, It's even more valuable to me. So thank you, thank you, thank you. You guys keep walking your walk. Don't take any shit. But if you do, do it with grace.